Okay, moving on to section E, costs and credits. So basically, the kinds of costs that are eligible, assuming that we have at least one eligible project now, we've written up a description, we think it qualifies, we've identified the activities, and we say, okay, now we want to submit a claim. What kind of costs can we attribute to the work? And there's a couple main areas. We're going to talk about each of these in a separate section. The first and the most common on most claims is the wages of your direct employees. So your own staff time on things. And there's some interesting rules on different types of employees and, and how it's applied. The next is any materials. Materials that are either consumed, rendered valueless in the research, destroyed, or materials that are transformed into prototypes that may be consumed or may change to commercial use. And then there's different effects that happen there. <clears throat> instead of paying employees, very often we may pay contractors. So instead of having my own full-time software developer on staff, I may hire a, a company to do software development for me. Again, which could qualify, but a different set of rules. We then get to <clears throat> pick from different methods to allocate our overhead costs. We'll talk about the different methods and pros and cons <clears throat> as a result of that. And lastly, there's allocations for capital equipment. So equipment that tends to have value more than one year, whether it be computers or machinery <clears throat> or manufacturing and research assets, testing equipment. Now, most people are familiar with the idea of a tax credit, that I spend money and I get a portion of that money back from the government via the tax system. There's also a concept that came out before the tax credits for experimental development called the expenditure pool. And basically that says that any of these expenses that we incur and track during the year, and file a claim for SRDD credits for, we can choose to deduct during that year or not deduct. So an example would be I buy a million dollar piece of capital equipment, a big machine, which I say is intended to be used 90% or more of its economic life in experimental development activities. I can choose to deduct the full million dollar cost of that machine on my income statement for tax purposes in that year. Whereas if it was normal manufacturing machinery, I may only be able to deduct 20 to 30% a year, depending on what class I put that in, <coughs> and have to amortize or, or recognize those tax deductions over a series of years. So it's an incentive that way. On the flip side, I may have expenses that I choose not to deduct for tax purposes. Can anyone think of a situation where you might not want to deduct an expense for tax purposes? Losses. Exactly. So let's say that we have losses carried forward as a company. We have lost $4 million over the past <coughs> date since inception. And what happens to those losses if you don't use them up? Does anyone know? Within a certain time frame. They expire. They're non-capital losses. If they're business losses, they'll expire. So if I don't use them up within 7 to 20 years, depending on the year I actually incurred the loss in the first place, and there's different extension points, then those losses are gone. What the incentives say is, if any of those losses can be attributed to SRND activities, the government wants to treat those more favorably. They say, we realize SRND activities are risky. They don't always result in a profit. They can increase your losses. And we want that work done in Canada. So as an incentive, any of the losses that you can attribute to SRND, you can choose not to deduct. You can leave them in something called the SRND pool of deductible expenses, which are very much like losses, except they never expire. Okay? So if it takes me 50 years to get profitable in year 51, I can start deducting those SRND expenses that otherwise would have been expired losses. Okay? Doesn't apply to everyone, but if you see a company with losses about to expire in the next couple of years, you want to start looking at that strategy now, or in fact, even maybe retroactively restating statements where they haven't done it. So here's some quick details on the expenditure pool. I won't spend much time on it, <coughs> other than we've more or less talked about that in the first slide. Yes? How do you know if like, you're bringing out a product in next year, you can, can you know what your revenues are of the increase in all of the year? You can then use the expenses in the second year, or in the second year. That's exactly right. Oh, okay. You can use it in any future year, and you can carry it back three years, taxation years. Um, 
So there's some adjustments to the pool that rather than going in depth on this slide, I'm going to talk about them as we hit those adjustments in the next couple sections. The tax credits themselves fall at various rates. There's a basic federal credit of 20% to all types of corporations, general partnerships, and or individuals on their personal tax returns, what you call a T1. The personal tax return that you file, you can claim a 20% tax credit. If you're something called a qualified Canadian controlled private corporation, qualified CCPC, there's various enhanced credits that tend to be higher in the, in the percentage of credit that you get and they tend to be refundable, meaning that if you have no taxes payable, you get the remaining money, whatever the credit is, plus interest as a refund in that year. There's also various provincial incentives that piggyback on the federal incentives. So the first is the CCPC, Canadian Controlled Private Corporation, which will, if it's qualified, it'll get a 35% fully refundable ITC up to something called its expenditure limit. The expenditure limit is typically now $3 million for all companies under common control. So the first $3 million that you spend each year gets this higher level of incentive, and if you go over the expenditure limit, then your ITC rate federally goes from 35% down to 20%. If you're an individual or certain types of trust, you can get a 20% credit, which is 40% refundable, but there's no provincial incentives. Most provincial incentives apply only to corporations. So there's only federal credits at an individual level. My rule of thumb on individual is if you're spending more than $15,000 a year on SRNED, it makes sense to incorporate and not do it as an individual. Less than that, it may make sense just to keep it in your basement and, and file it on your personal return. Corporations other than a CCPC, so that would be foreign controlled corporations or companies that are listed on a public stock exchange in Canada, has a 20% credit, non-refundable. A lot of these companies don't bother to claim because they've got 20, 30, 40 million dollars of lost carry forwards that they can use to eliminate any tax. So they say, why do I want to pay more money to get a non-refundable credit that's probably never going to be used because I've got to use up all these losses in the next 20 years before I can even think about credits. All right. There's a big push in Parliament to make these credits all are partially refundable to keep some of the R&D that these companies are now moving offshore as a result back here in Canada. All other taxpayers basically get a 20% credit non-refundable. 